back to school. Let's get to lab, get some lab work done. How's everybody doing? Hi, hey, how's it going, Art? Nice to see you. What's up, bears? What's up, bears? Our manatee. Oh, yep, my favorite. How you doing, Deek Deek? Good to see you. It's good to be back. It's pretty quiet in here. Gonna get some lab work done today. Here we go, back down the hallway. Let's see, is Cassidy in the hallway? Nope, I beat her. Let's get into lab, let's get some lab work going. Here we go. And we're back at it. Wait, how could this be? The Deem's not in lab. He's always in lab. Huh. Okay, let's get organized here. So if you haven't already, read the introduction to nylon synthesis document. Um, <clears throat> pause the video now and just go read that and that'll get you ready to go. It's in our normal like lab guides area. Uh, let's see. It's down here in the lab guides and the intro to nylon synthesis. And uh, that's at this web address but you guys know where it is okay so <clears throat> after you've done the intro then you'll skim the procedure for nylon synthesis document if you like you actually don't have to because uh, this this is in the lab guide area as well but the procedure is actually going to be embedded into the video so if you don't skim the procedure beforehand it's okay because I'll have it throughout the lab video and then uh, so you'll and then what you should do now is pause this video and go over to the report worksheet for nylon synthesis because the beginning parts of that you can complete to get you ready for the rest of the video. And uh, it has you doing some curved arrow mechanisms that are explained in the intro. And then it'll actually say in the report worksheet, okay, now come back to the video. So then you'll come back here, watch the video and fill in the report worksheet it should be pretty hopefully you, it's an interesting and easy for you guys to fill out the information you need to turn in the report okay so pause now and I'll see you in a little bit as I was saying I have the procedure here embedded into the video so the procedure is a file a Google Doc online as well but since you're not going to be performing the experiment this semester you can just uh, have me talk you through it um, so you normally you'd bring in a plastic from your house like a plastic sandwich bag or something and we would take an IR of it and the reason why we're taking IRs of polymers is because they're big molecules that usually aren't soluble in organic solvents or NMR solvents so you can't take an NMR easily of a of a polymer so most often polymers are analyzed by IR it's not as good as NMR but just the way it is so uh, we could try to identify an unknown polymer that we have around us uh, like we're gonna do and uh, the way we do it is we look up the IR spectrum of a known sample. And uh, NMR, uh, I mean, IRs of polymers aren't as easy to find online as they are right in our lab. We have this Aldrich book with thousands of IR spectrums, and we'll look through that and see if we can uh, find something to match an unknown and also look to see if we can find one that matches the uh, nylon 66 IR. Um, and then we'll label the specter like we've done before, drawn out a portion of the, we wouldn't draw the entire polymer because that's thousands and thousands of atoms, but you draw just a portion of it. And then make sure you label it correctly. A lot of times people are turning in stuff and they're not like getting the right IR peak. So like for example, the one that's missed a lot is the sp2 carbon to hydrogen signals are a little over 3000 where the sp3 carbon to hydrogen is a little less. So you should look for those and label them correctly. All right, let's move on. So uh, what I decided to take an IR of, uh, this plastic bag, <clears throat> which was back in the IR room, it has a, a blue tube in it. This tube is, is meant for, if we wanted to, we can hook up a nitrogen gas tank to our IR and have a slow flow of nitrogen gas into the chamber with the ATR adapter and where you put your sample. And the reason for that is if you want to get all the moisture and CO2 out of the air around your sample, but I don't mind having that, I run a background and we get rid of it that way. So we don't have a nitrogen tank hooked up to the IR, but you could. And um, But we're gonna take an IR of this bag, not the plastic, blue plastic, this bag here. So it's just a plastic bag like this. Let's see what it looks like on the IR. So we'll come over to our IR, and remember we have our ATR adapter, attenuated total reflectance. 
Remember how that works? The IR light comes in and hits a mirror that's in this black box and it bounces up into a zinc selenide crystal and that's that little gold peak there you'll see that's like the tip of the iceberg there's underneath the metal there's zinc selenide and the infrared light bounces through there ding 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 and it does total reflectance like a fiber optic cable kind of and then when you have sample on the zinc selenide crystal some of the infrared light leaches into the sample and it might be absorbed or not and then it bounces back out onto another mirror off to the detector and we get our spectrum in so that's the zinc selenide crystal right there okay so here we are back at the IR we're gonna take a background so click OK. Bloop. OK, it's taking the background. Two of four scans ready. Looking like our normal background, right? Bloop. Oh, there it is. It's done with its four scans. We can overwrite the old background. So we're going to use this current day's background scan and not the one from whoever ran the background last. And here it is. It looks pretty good, right? I think you recognize that. And since we got this up here, let's, let's, let's describe it. Uh, we'll label some signals and put a I put a uh, text box on it. I'm not going to print it, but I was just showing you. That's what we do. And then I labeled a few of the peaks like you've done, right? And uh, let's see, what do we think these guys are? These are things that are in the air or inside of the IR instrument itself. So what's here around 3,742? It's actually water. Now, you might think, that doesn't look like water should look. Water has, you'd think it would have a regular like parabolic OH signal. But this isn't normal water that we're used to seeing or normal, like an alcohol we're used to seeing. This is gaseous water. So gaseous water is going to behave differently than liquid water. And that's because gaseous water molecules are far apart from each other and they're not hydrogen bonding like in a liquid. So what's causing that? It's pretty interesting. It's a, uh, it dances back and forth like that, right? Do, let's see. So you got to... <clears throat> asymmetric stretch there and uh, that causes these signals over here I th there might be a I don't think there there might be a symmetric I bet there's symmetric stretching that causes some of those as well I'm not 100% sure and then what about a little less than 3,000 what's that gonna be oh that's a polymer plastic so this isn't the plastic bag that we're about to run this is plastic which is inside of the IR spectrometer so inside of the IR there's a a big uh, potassium bromide crystal disc that is uh, moisture sensitive. It's very hydroscopic. And if you let moisture by it, it, the moisture will hydrate it and start to damage it. So we protect that a number of ways. One way is it's coated in this plastic. And the plastic is a long hydrocarbon polymer with a bunch of carbon hydrogen bonds. And those are sp3 carbon hydrogens. So we expect them to be a little less than 3000. So how does that's the plastic hydrocarbon, and it's to keep the KBR disc inside the IR dry. And how does it, what does it do when it gets hit with that wavelength of infrared? Boom, 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 gets the asymmetric stretch. And I, I don't remember which is which. I was looking it up, and I just, I got to get going with stuff. So this one is maybe the asymmetric, and that's the symmetric stretch. I don't remember. What, one is one, and one is the other. That's it. All right, now this guy in the middle, you remember what that one is, right? <sighs> carbon dioxide. So that's just CO2 in the air. <coughs> and it's nice to see this. It fluctuates a lot in lab, depending how, ma how many people are in lab. Um, so how does that work? Well, it's not this stretch. That's a symmetric stretch. And symmetric, the symmetric stretch like that is not, a, it's not uh, active in the IR, so it doesn't absorb infrared light, that stretch, or it doesn't get displayed. Uh, but you have this Anti-symmetric stretch. See that? There we go. Wait, was the first one the symmetric? Uh, yeah, so this one's the asymmetric. And that one does show up, and that's what we're going to see at about 2360 there. Okay, and then the rest of these here, um, I was looking it up. I always thought it was carbon-hydrogen and carbon-carbon bond absorptions due to the plastic, but uh, I saw online somebody was saying it's water vapor, so maybe it's both, I'm not sure, but it looks like it's water vapor, so look, it's doing a boom, boom, bam, 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 doing a bend. So there we go, this is water, and probably the plastic as well, it's gotta be. Uh, and then, uh, here we go. We ran our background, looks good, and now we're gonna put the plastic bag on the ATR adapter, and we're gonna turn the wheel to crush it down on the zinc selenide crystal, and I turned it tight, so I just barely see any of the silver above this copper. 
and there there it is and I start scanning it one of four scans it's showing up and then boom it's done and I label some signals so what's going on with this guy we got a signal less than 3000 so what's that sp3 carbon hydrogen right and then we have a little bit at 2354 what's that caused by it has that certain like doublet shape like that do you remember what that is that's carbon dioxide turns out there was a a little more carbon dioxide while this plastic bag was run than while the background scan was run so the background scan canceled out most of the carbon dioxide but we're still seeing a little bit so that's fine that's just part of air and then we've got some different carbon carbon this is probably like a carbon hydrogen bending i think i'm not sure but uh so yeah let's that's what we our, our ir looks like let's see if we can identify it by going over uh, oh, and this spectra is going to be in your report worksheet. So in just a second, I'm going to head, send you over there to go to the report worksheet and draw a portion of the polymer we think this is and then label the signals like we do. But first, let's try to identify it. <clears throat> We're going to look it up in the uh, IR spectra book and see if we can find a close match. So uh, you guys don't have that IR spectra book at your house, but it's in our lab. Boom, it was up on the shelf. You can see we got, this is like pre-internet data here. Here's a bunch of NMR spectrums. Another book of more NMR spectrums is volume one through five and six through 11. <clears throat> and then down here, we've got a, the Aldrich Library of Infrared Spectra. So this is the, the book that I'm gonna show you pictures of. So if you open the book up just to any random page, I opened it up here to page 1494. Looks like I have this, they're grouped according to uh, functional groups. And uh, this is steroids and indole, indole alkaloids. <clears throat> so look, that looks like a steroid, huh? Six, 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 five, six, 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 five. Yeah, so we got a bunch of steroids and you see their IR spectrum. So each page has six spectra and there's thousands of pages, so lots of spectra. Huh? And then um, <clears throat> if you go to the back of the text, that book, the last category is polymers. So that's way down at 1,569. And you'll find uh, you can see all these different polymers. <clears throat> they start off with uh, the first one here is polyethylene. That's the most uh, produced polymer in the world. Um, and so that makes sense, and it's the simplest. It's just straight CH2 long chain. Um, so let's zoom in on that guy. Let's look at it. Oh, I'm gonna zoom in later. Okay, hold on. So the polyethylene's here, and then we got uh, different polymers too. So what you're going to do is you're going to just visually look at these and see which ones look kind of like the, the polymer IR that we took. So uh, did I go two slides? Here's another page. Yeah, this is 500. This is uh, 1,570, 1,573. So I skipped some pages. So you can see there's a bunch of these polymers. Um, let's look at the polyethylene, that very first one, and compare it to ours. So this is the, the Ziploc bag. Looks pretty good. Uh, Ours is clearly two signals here, but theirs could be. Theirs is done differently than ours. Theirs was done as a xylene film. What that means is they took the polyethylene plastic, dissolved it in xylene, the solvents, you know, the benzene with two methyls, and then they put that on a zinc, uh, I'm sorry, a sodium chloride salt plate. And they let the solvent evaporate, and then they took the IR of it. So ours was just pressed onto a zinc solenoid crystal with an ATR adapter, so it's looking a little different. And this is an older spectra too. But so maybe that is the same as there. They're not, they don't have the CO2 in their signal, but that's all right, because we, uh, we just, they might have been purging nitrogen gas through. And then this looks pretty similar here. It's about 1500, 1500, looks pretty good. And this little guy right here looks pretty good. I think it looks really good. This guy, theirs is a double little peak here, but ours isn't, but maybe it is a little bit. So it's hard to be exactly positive matching up these IRs if you don't take them on the exact same instrument. But I think it's polyethylene, that plastic bag. And uh, I also I think it's because of the IR, but also because polyethylene is just the most common plastic in the world. So let's say that your plastic bag then is polyethylene. Here's the recycle codes for the most common plastic. So the recycle code number one is this polyethylene terephthalate. Uh, it's a copolymer like our nylon you're going to see. And um, it recycle code one, so you see that number one on a bottle, like a water bottle or something. You know that that's what it's made of. And then uh, the polyethylene we were looking at, here's high density polyethylene and low density polyethylene. 
the high density one, it has a higher density and it's a, it's a harder plastic it, and it's used for like milk cartons and things like that. And then the low density, that's for a, like bubble wrap and things like that. And that one is, it has a, it actually the polymer chains, they're not just linear chains, they have branches and the branches can attach to another chain and uh, the low density polyethylene has more branches so that molecules can't get closer. They, they're not as dense and it's more flexible. Interesting, we got polypropylene, that was part of the uh, beginning too. That's a, another common one, polystyrene and uh, some others, yeah. So uh, the next thing we're gonna do, we have another sample that we're gonna run. Look at this, the old NMR, there it is. Remember, you gotta, you gotta jiggle the inject button sometimes, it gets, it's got a bad connection. So we're gonna run this sample. This sample is a plastic that you see in, um, in the windows of letters. So if you ever get a letter in the mail and it has like your return address or something through there, you can read it. That's the, this, this plastic. Um, I did it two ways. I ran it on the zinc selenide crystal with the ATR adapter like always. But I also took out this zinc selenide crystal. Remember I was telling you there's a mirror that the infrared light hits and it bounces up into the zinc selenide crystal and it comes out. This is the other side and it comes back down out of this it's this mirror goes to the detector. So yeah, I took that out. So here's the compartment without the ATR adapter. And when you do this, you have to redo a background scan because now you're not going through zinc selenide crystals. You're just going through the air and whatever's in the inside of the machine. So we, we, I, redid, I redid that. This is the background scan with the ATR adapter. That's the background scan from earlier. And you'll see the energy value here goes to 12.4. And now here is the background after I've taken the ATR adapter out. Uh, and now you can see it's absorbing, up, it's getting a lot stronger signals, the energy is up to 60. So yeah, when you don't have the ATR adapter in there, you get better spectra, but only slightly better, so the ATR adapter is totally worth it. Um, so here's the letter window I was showing you earlier. Here it is run with the ATR adapter. You see some signals a little over 3,000 sp2 carbon hydrogens, a little under 3,000 sp3 carbon hydrogens. We see this 2330, that might be, it looks like CO2, the number's a little low. And then we got some other stuff here. This here is what's called, it looks like aromatic overtones. So this was done with the ATR adapter. And then I ran it again without the ATR adapter after that new background. And look at how much stronger everything is. Look at this, all this here. And this aromatic overtones, strong through here, huh? And all this, but, so you can see uh, when you don't use a, uh, ATR adapter. It's uh, called transmission IR, so that infrared light had to transmit through that clear plastic. You get stronger signals. And I, I held this with my hand. My hand was like trying to hold it still, but it was shaking a little bit, and I was curious if that made a difference. So here it is, the plastic. I was shining, letting the infrared light shine through it, so I had to hold it still as I could for four scans. And then um, I thought, well, maybe because I was holding it still, I got all this waviness, you know, this wavy stuff here. This is a not, I don't always see that. So I tried it again with the little holder. So this is where the ATR adapter normally goes, but I got this, you could screw in this holder and then it'll hold on to the uh, plastic for you. So now it's completely still at a certain uh, distance the whole time. And uh, when I took the, here's, here when I took the, uh, the IR of it then, looks the same to me. I think this noise here is due to uh, the instrument needs to be calibrated. I think the, the mirrors that you saw the light shining through, they have to be adjusted a little bit. But that's okay. Here is the actual molecule, and you might have saw it earlier. This is actually polystyrene. That's the uh, type of polymer this is. And the, what, I was, what we were taking the IR of when we pressed this onto the zinc selenide crystal, we get, it was the ATR adapter IR. And then when we had the infrared light pass through it, either handheld or in the holder, that was transmission IR. And um, you can see it matches up really well. See the peaks just over 3,000, just under 3,000. Aromatic overtones. It's looking real similar. We've got an extra signal here at about 40, 34, and they don't. It's interesting. I'm not, I wonder if that, about that. Let's look into that some more. So yeah, once again, here's the transmission IR without the ATR adapter. And this is with the ATR adapter. You can see it's got similar signals, but much stronger, huh? So I went over to my book. 
looked up styrene and I, I looked up styrene first and then I thought, wait, no, this is polystyrene. But then I thought, hey, well, let's look at that too. So styrene is at page 569 and it's the C spectrum. Then I went over and found polystyrene. That's at 1593 F. So let's look at those. First, let's look at styrene. So styrene's here. You can see it's the monomer, the benzene ring with the alkene off of it. And here's the spectrum. And so uh, I'm going to have you, after I get done talking about this, you're going to draw this molecule. Well, it all, it's already drawn for you. You're going to label the spectra for this molecule. And then uh, when you do it, you're going to draw it with the representative groups that you need to label. So that's the sp2 carbon hydrogen. Boom, right there. Huh? So you'll draw your arrow like that. Easy. Okay, that's styrene. Now let's look at polystyrene. This is polystyrene. And uh, it's the polymer, and it's, it's interesting. It's no longer styrene. It no longer has this alkene because it's polymerized, right? So it looks like this. So what's new about this when you compare styrene to polystyrene? It has sp3 carbons. So you'll draw it out and draw in some of those sp3 carbons and then also the sp2 carbons, and you'll see just over 3,000 sp2 carbon hydrogens, just under 3,000 sp three carbon hydrogens. So now you should pause the video and go look at these spectra in the report worksheet and just label them like I said. Easy. Now for the fun part, we're going to make some nylon. So this is back to the procedure um, Google Doc. Uh, we're making nylon 6-6. Six, six. It's called nylon 6-6 six, six because we're going to take this six carbon diamine and a six carbon diacid chloride and we're gonna polymerize these together and you can see how you'll get an amide here, an amide there, an amide there, and then your final polymer, it's gonna, this is a very short portion of it, it's thousands of atoms long, and you'll get, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, three, five, six, over and over, so nylon six, six. Uh, and the procedure will be to, you know, you'll prepare this aqueous solution of the diamine, and then, um, it's slightly soluble in water, but 5% you can get it soluble. Yeah, a little sodium hydroxide to make the solution basic. And then you'll add the diacid chloride, which is dissolved in cyclohexane. So you have an aqueous and organic layer, and those two layers don't mix. The, uh, the density of cyclohexane is 0.78 grams per milliliter, so it'll be on the top, right? Water is 1 gram per milliliter. So it'll look something like this. You'll have uh, the aqueous layer with the diamine on the bottom slightly basic, mostly water, and then the organic layer above with the uh, diacid chloride, and they won't mix because an organic solvent like cyclohexane is not soluble in water. So this amine that's down in the bottom portion of the beaker can't react with the acid chloride up in this upper part of the uh, uh, cyclohexane. But right where the two surfaces, the aqueous and the organic layer, touch they react and instantly you'll see this film that forms and that not only is the that's the nylon polymer and it kind of helps keep those two layers separate but then we stick a copper hook in and we hook into this bit of a polymer film here and we pull it up and you'll see it forms like a tent and as it pulls up it takes some of the water through the organic layer and it, as they touch, they instantly react. So you just keep pulling out your uh, nylon thread as you pull up and up. And we can see how long of a thread we can get. Um, back in the uh, day, and then we'll take IR of it and we'll look through the rest of this. Back in the day, I had a student, Nikki Ferris, I think her name is, but AKA known as Nikki Nylon. She was really careful and she was able to pull out the nylon to be like 32 feet. And you'll see when I did it this time, I was nowhere near Nikki Lylon's uh, standard. Uh, but, uh, but those who can't do teach, I guess. Um, but then uh, I did have, there was a performance enhancing era for a while there. I remember it was Hugh and some other students, they wanted to beat Nikki Nylon's record. So they, uh, they were cheating a little bit. Instead of using 10 milliliters of each solution, I think they went like 20 milliliters of the aqueous 20 milliliters, so they had more reagents, so they were able to pull longer. But so that was during the performance enhanced errors. But if uh, I'll, I'm going to try to be about 10 milliliters, I think I wound up being like 15 milliliters because so I was just doing it quickly, but I still didn't even come close. Okay, hello. First, we'll add uh, the 
5% hexane diamine in water, about 10 milliliters. Let's see if we can get that. Eh, I'm cheating a little bit. This is gonna be a performance enhanced nylon synthesis. Okay, so I got that there. Next up, I'll add the 5% uh, adipyl chloride in uh, cyclohexane. So this is the diacid chloride, six carbons with acid chlorides on the ends. And it's in cyclohexane, which is less dense than the aqueous amine. So I'm gonna try to slowly add this and not let the layers mix. So I'll pipette some down the side. Am I doing a good job? I'm doing an okay job. The first little bit, if you can see, uh, of the cyclohexane diacid chloride, it's forming a, uh, a polymer of nylon, a little like blanket over the, the aqueous amine, so it's, that's preventing them from reacting too much. And I kind of cheated it. I added more than 10 milliliters initially of my aqueous solution. I was supposed to add 10 according to the procedure, but I wound up pouring about 15 milliliters. So maybe I'll go to about 30 right now, so I have an equal volume of the two solutions. So let's see, can you see that polymer film between the two layers? It's kind of maybe a little bit hard to see. Maybe if I come from this angle, maybe if it's on the black background. Yeah, I think I can see it. See that? There's a, there's a layer of a nylon that formed between the aqueous and the organic layer, aqueous layer on the bottom. So we're gonna hook into that and pull out a thread of nylon. Okay, here comes the best part. Wish you guys were able to be here to do it. I got this uh, piece of copper wire I made into a hook. And I'm gonna drop that, I'll fake it first. I'm gonna put it in through the top cyclohexane layer with the diacid chloride into the aqueous layer. And then that film between the two, the hook will catch on and then it'll pull that film up. And as it does, it'll pull some of the lower aqueous layer through the organic layer and it'll keep polymerizing into nylon. So let's see how long of a nylon strand I can make. Isn't that awesome? If I continue to pull slowly, I'll get a longer and longer strand of nylon. Our longest strand on, a, on a, during the non performance enhanced era where you where the student actually just used 10 milliliters of each solution was done by Nikki Nylon hers was like 32 feet mine potentially could be longer because I used 15 and 15 milliliters and now I have to be creative to try to keep it going without breaking it oh did it break oh my goodness I'm terrible <laughs> I got about two feet Nikki Nylon totally beat my record. Let's see, I can get another one though. Maybe I'll be better this time. Maybe I gotta go, f oh no, terrible. I, this is actually, I think, the very first time I've done it on my own. I usually just watch you guys do it. So yeah, I guess if you can't do teach. <laughs> Here we go, come on buddy. Let's see if we, oh, it broke again. I'm terrible. Oh, shoot. I didn't add the base. This is awesome. Yeah. I, uh, I made a mistake and we're gonna learn from it. All right, now to do it correctly. I've added my aqueous 1,6 uh, hexane diamine and I'll make it basic before I add the organic layer. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten drops of the 20% sodium hydroxide. Third time's a charm. I'm gonna swirl that around a little bit. So what I'm doing is I'm making sure my aqueous solution is basic. 
so that when the uh, amine reacts with the acid chloride, there's a base there to deprotonate. Not to, so instead of the amine being protonated, the sodium hydroxide, the hydroxide is protonated. So now for my diacid chloride, my adipyl chloride, I've got to add about 10 milliliters of that. So. fighting me a little bit. Oh, you know what? Maybe it's not just me. Maybe it's just our solutions today. Maybe these are older. I don't know. Yeah, it's not working out very good today. Still getting some nylon though, but you can usually get a longer strand of it. side. Ugh. Yeah, I thought maybe the, having a basic would make it a lot better, but this one again, this one's pretty cool. So if I bring it up close and make sure it's focused and then I swirl it around, I can get a big glob, huh? Look at that guy. Like snot jellyfish or something huh okay so we made some nylon next I'm gonna do is the next thing I'll do is characterize it and since it's a solid you can't easily uh, get an NMR of it um, because usually you know we have to dissolve things and uh, organic NMR solvents to get an NMR since it's it's long huge long polymer it's not going to dissolve in our organic solvents so instead of doing IR we will do instead of doing NMR we'll do IR because you can get an IR of a solid, especially, and it's especially easily, easy because we have the ATR adapter. Now we'll collect and uh, analyze some data from our nylon synthesis. I have the nylon on this uh, piece of paper towel to help dry it because it's wet with uh, water and cyclohexane. I'm doing this on the bench by locker 221. Whose locker is that? 221. I'm using your bench. Thanks. So I folded the paper towel over and I'm drying it off and I, I didn't show it but I actually rinsed it off with water first too before this to rinse off the excess reagents and things. And then I take it out of the paper towel and it's pretty dry. If I wait a day or two to be extra dry but I went ahead and took the spectrum of it right away. And uh, oh, oh and at 11 there were a couple students in here. We got a uh, Sid at the computer taking an NMR there. And uh, Cassidy's back here. She's uh, running something on, uh, samples on the HPLC, maybe some diet soda samples. So we had a couple students in lab that day. So uh, the first thing I did is uh, I made like that clump of uh, um, nylon when I just kind of swirled the two solutions together. And I tried taking an IR of that transmission IR without the ATR adapter. So you can see I'm holding it in the IR beam. The red light's actually a red visible light laser that's part of the infrared spectrometer's um, interferometer. Um, here's how it looks. Not very good. <laughs> so uh, that, that clump, if I go back, the clump of uh, nylon's pretty thick. If it's too thick, it doesn't let enough IR light through it. It's not thin enough. But I can still see some stuff happen in here. A little less than 3,000, huh? some alkane, sp3 carbon hydrogens. And then I tried it again where I tried to stretch it out, get it a little thinner, and tape it onto the little holder, but uh, not much better, if at all better. Let's see, yeah, we got the sp3 carbon hydrogen again, but that's about it. Do we see a carbonyl? Uh, that might be a carbonyl. I didn't label that one. I should have. Well, no, no, carbonyl would go over here. Yeah, this might be carbonyl issue. Yeah, so not very good. So instead, I put the ATR adapter back onto the. Um, IR spectrometer and when you do that now the infrared light has to go through the zinc selenide crystal before it goes to the detector so what do we have to redo the background scan yep and you'll see the background it's, it's at a low energy again because the infrared light is absorbed a lot by the uh, zinc selenide crystal and I'm seeing the water vapor the plastic alkane CHs carbon dioxide water vapor carbon plastic Okay, and then so I, I ran that clump of uh, nylon that I was trying to do transmission-wise on the ATR adapter. Much better in this case, right? So I've got my 
signal at 3,000, about 300. That's the NH bond of the uh, amide. And you can see there's a little bit of something here. That's water. So this guy's still a little wet. The clump's harder to get dry because it's it's got uh, it's a bigger, clumpier thing. And then we got alkane signals and the carbonyl. So after I ran the clump, I decided, oh, my main thing I like is the uh, the strand. So this is my strand that I made. Um, I put it on the ATR adapter, squeezed it down. Now its IR came out better. It's a little drier, huh? Remember that there's still a little moisture, it looks like, but remember for the clump of nylon, it was bigger. So I got my IR here, it's looking pretty good. And then uh, I weighed it out as well. And it was uh, that strand I had was 0.03. 380 grams, so like, uh, what's that, one, two, three, 38 milligrams. And then I measured out the length of it. It turns out it's about 28 inches and that'd be a half, four eighths, five eighths, 28 and five eighths inches long. And then I went back to my IR spectrum book to see if I can find a nylon in there to compare it to the nylon IR I took. And yep, there's some nylons here. We got Nylon 6.6, 6, that's the one we're going to use on page 1590 Spectrum D. But they also have Nylon 6.9 and Nylon 6, 6.10. There's different nylons, but... Okay, so here's our Nylon 6.6 6 that we want to compare ours to. Looks, first glance, it looks pretty similar. Let's put them side by side, yeah. So we have our NH bond. This is for the nitrogen to hydrogen bond right there. That NH bond, we have that as well. And you have the sp3 carbon to hydrogens here. Uh, I'm not sure what this is, but we have the similar thing there too. And then the carbonyl. It's looking really good all through the fingerprint region. Very similar, right? Looks like we made uh, the nylon. <clears throat> and then here's the nylon spectrum. I put this in the Google Doc uh, report worksheet, and you're going to label this. And just, you know, do as always, draw an arrow starting on the NH bond to its signal, boom. And then then uh, draw the CH, sp3 carbon to hydrogen to their signals, and then the carbonyl, of course. Boom, there it is. Carbonyl is not quite 1700, right? And that's common for amides. And uh, so here's your data that you'll need to fill out the um, report worksheet. So maybe pause the video at this data and then go to the report worksheet and start filling it out. And then, and then you're pretty much done. Uh, I'll actually put a little end note to the video if you wanna come back to see that after you're done with your report. Hey, look who's dropping in. It's Vadim and Ryan. Welcome back, guys.